Chapter 6 It was pleasant to Dr. Watson to find himself once more in the untidy room of the first floor in Baker Street which had been the starting point of so many remarkable adventures. He looked round him at the scientific charts upon the wall, the acid-charred bench of chemicals, the violin case leaning in the corner, the coal scuttle, which contained of old the pipes and tobacco. Finally, his eyes came round to the fresh and smiling face of Billy, the young but very wise and tactful page who had helped a little to fill up the gap of loneliness and isolation which surrounded the Saturnine figure of the great detective. It all seems very unchanged, Billy. You don't change, either. I hope the same can be said of him. Billy glanced with some solicitude at the closed door of the bedroom. I think he's in bed and asleep he said. It was seven in the evening of a lovely summer's day, but Dr. Watson was sufficiently familiar with the irregularity of his old friend's hours to feel no surprise at the idea. That means a case, I suppose. Yes, sir, he is very hard at it just now. I'm frightened for his health. He gets paler and thinner and he eats nothing. When will you be pleased to dine, Mr. Holmes? Mrs. Hudson asked. 7.30, the day after tomorrow, said he. You know his way when he is keen on a case. Yes, Billy, I know. He's following someone. Yesterday he was out as a workman looking for a job. Today he was an old woman. Fairly took me in, he did, and I ought to know his ways by now. Billy pointed with a grin to a very baggy parasol which leaned against the sofa. That's part of the old woman's outfit, he said. But what is it all about, Billy? Billy sank his voice, as one who discusses great secrets of state. I don't mind telling you, sir, but it should go no farther. It's this case of the crown diamond. What the hundred thousand pound burglary? Yes, sir. They must get it back, sir. Why? We had the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary both sitting on that very sofa. Mr. Holmes was very nice to them. He soon put them at their ease and promised he would do all he could. Then there is Lord Cantlemere. Ah. Yes, sir, you know what that means. He's a stiff, un, sir, if I may say so. I can get along with the Prime Minister, and I've nothing against the Home Secretary, who seemed a civil, obliging sort of man, but I can't stand his lordship. Neither can Mr. Holmes, sir. You see, he don't believe in Mr. Holmes and he was against employing him. He'd rather he failed, and Mr. Holmes knows it. Mr. Holmes always knows whatever there is to know. Well, we'll hope he won't fail and that Lord Cantlemere will be confounded. But I say, Billy, what is that curtain for across the window? Mr. Holmes had it put up there three days ago. We've got something funny behind it. Billy advanced and drew away the drapery which screened the alcove of the bow window. Dr. Watson could not restrain a cry of amazement. There was a facsimile of his old friend, dressing gown and all, the face turned three quarters towards the window and downward, as though reading an invisible book, while the body was sunk deep in an armchair. Billy detached the head and held it in the air. 
we put it at different angles, so that it may seem more lifelike. I wouldn't dare touch it if the blind were not down. But when it's up you can see this from across the way. We used something of the sort once before. Before my time, said Billy. He drew the window curtains apart and looked out into the street. There are folk who watch us from over yonder. I can see a fellow now at the window. Have a look for yourself. Watson had taken a step forward when the bedroom door opened, and the long, thin form of Holmes emerged, his face pale and drawn, but his step and bearing as active as ever. With a single spring he was at the window, and had drawn the blind once more. That will do, Billy, said he. You were in danger of your life then, my boy, and I can't do without you just yet. Well, Watson, it is good to see you in your old quarters once again. You come at a critical moment. So I gather. You can go, Billy. That boy is a problem, Watson. How far am I justified in allowing him to be in danger? Danger of what, Holmes? Of sudden death. I'm expecting something this evening. Expecting what? To be murdered, Watson. No, no, you are joking, Holmes. Even my limited sense of humor could evolve a better joke than that. But we may be comfortable in the meantime, may we not? Is alcohol permitted? The gasogen and cigars are in the old place. Let me see you once more in the customary armchair. You have not, I hope, learned to despise my pipe and my lamentable tobacco. It has to take the place of food these days. But why not eat? Because the faculties become refined when you starve them. Why, surely, as a doctor, my dear Watson, you must admit that what your digestion gains in the way of blood supply is so much lost to the brain. But this danger, Holmes. Ah, yes, in case it should come off, it would perhaps be as well that you should burden your memory with the name and address of the murderer. Write it down, man, write it down. 136 Moorside Gardens, N. W. Got it. Watson's honest face was twitching with anxiety. He knew only too well the immense risks taken by Holmes and was well aware that what he said was more likely to be understatement than exaggeration. Watson was always the man of action, and he rose to the occasion. Your morals don't improve, Watson. You bear every sign of the busy medical man, with calls on him every hour. Can't you have this fellow arrested? Yes, Watson, I could. Ah. Billy told me the missing crown jewel. Yes, the great yellow Mazaran stone. And is this Count Silvius one of your fish? Yes, and he's a shark. Where is this Count Silvius? I've been at his very elbow all the morning. By your leave, madam, said he half Italian, you know, and with the southern graces of manner when in the mood, but a devil incarnate in the other mood. Strobenzi made the air gun a very pretty bit of work, as I understand, and I rather fancy it is in the opposite window at the present moment. Have you seen the dummy? Of course, Billy showed it to you. Well, it may get a bullet through its beautiful head at any moment. Ah, Billy, what is it? The boy had reappeared in the room with a card upon a tray. 
Holmes glanced at it with raised eyebrows and an amused smile. This is a proof that he feels my toe very close behind his heel. Would you glance carefully out of the window, Watson, and see if anyone is hanging about in the street? Watson looked warily round the edge of the curtain. That will be Sam Merton the faithful but rather fatuous Sam. Where is this gentleman, Billy? In the waiting room, sir. Watson waited until the door was closed, and then he turned earnestly to his companion. In his way. No, my dear fellow in my way. This man has come for his own purpose, but he may stay for mine. Holmes took out his notebook and scribbled a few lines. Take a cab to Scotland Yard and give this to Yole of the Sea. Ah. D. Come back with the police. Before you return I may have just time enough to find out where the stone is. I rather want to see my shark without his seeing me, and I have, as you will remember, my own way of doing it. It was an empty room into which Billy, a minute later, ushered Count Silvius. He was well dressed, but his brilliant necktie, shining pin, and glittering rings were flamboyant in their effect. As the door closed behind him he looked round him with fierce, startled eyes, like one who suspects a trap at every turn. He took one more glance round to see that there were no witnesses, and then, on tiptoe, his thick stick half raised, he approached the silent figure. He was crouching for his final spring and blow when a cool, sardonic voice greeted him from the open bedroom door don't break it count don't break it the assassin staggered back amazement in his convulsed face it's a pretty little thing said holmes advancing towards the image would you care to put your revolver out also oh very good, if you prefer to sit upon it. The Count scowled, with heavy, threatening eyebrows. I, too, wished to have some words with you, Holmes. Holmes swung his leg on the edge of the table. But why these personal attentions? Because you have gone out of your way to annoy me. It is a small point, Count Silvius, but perhaps you would kindly give me my prefix when you address me. Now you give my little impersonations your kindly praise. It was you you yourself. Holmes shrugged his shoulders. You can see in the corner the parasol which you so politely handed to me in the minories before you began to suspect. As it happens, you did not know, so here we are. The Count's knotted brows gathered more heavily over his menacing eyes. Well, but why? Why? The sport, the excitement, the danger. And, no doubt, to free the country from a pest. Exactly. My reasons in a nutshell. The Count sprang to his feet and his hand involuntarily moved back to his hip pocket. Sit down, sir, sit down. There was another, more practical, reason. I want that yellow diamond. Count Silvius lay back in his chair with an evil smile. The real reason why you are here tonight is to find out how much I know about the matter and how far my removal is absolutely essential. Well, I should say that, from your point of view, it is absolutely essential, for I know all about it, save only one thing, which you are about to tell me. Oh, you want to know that, do you? How the devil should I be able to tell you where it is? 
You can, and you will. Holmes's eyes, as he gazed at him, contracted and lightened until they were like two menacing points of steel. Then, of course, you see where the diamond is. Holmes clapped his hands with amusement, and then pointed a derisive finger. Now, Count, if you will be reasonable we can do business. Count Silvius threw up his eyes to the ceiling. Holmes looked at him thoughtfully like a master chess player who meditates his crowning move. Do you know what I keep in this book? No, sir, I do not. You. Me. Yes, sir, you. You are all here every action of your vile and dangerous life. Damn you, Holmes, cried the Count with blazing eyes. There are limits to my patience. It's all here, Count. Tut. You will make nothing of that. Plenty more here, Count. Then I am right on the others. Now, Count, you are a card player. When the other fellow has all the trumps, it saves time to throw down your hand. What has all this talk to do with the jewel of which you spoke? Gently, Count. The veins stood out on the Count's forehead. His dark, hairy hands were clenched in a convulsion of restrained emotion. That's the hand I play from, said Holmes. What good are you going to get out of your diamond? None in the world. If you hand it over well. I'll compound a felony. I think, Count, that it would be as well to have your friend Sam at this conference. If you tell him that Count Silvius wants him he will certainly come. What are you going to do now? Asked the Count as Billy disappeared. The Count had risen from his chair, and his hand was behind his back. Holmes held something half protruding from the pocket of his dressing gown. Does it matter very much? After all, Count, your own exit is more likely to be perpendicular than horizontal. Why not give ourselves up to the unrestrained enjoyment of the present? A sudden wild beast light sprang up in the dark menacing eyes of the master criminal you know perfectly well that you dare not use it even if i gave you time to draw it holmes's debonair manner was a new experience and though he vaguely felt that it was hostile he did not know how to counter it what's the game now count what's this fellow want what's up his voice was deep and raucous. The Count shrugged his shoulders, and it was Holmes who answered. I'm going into that bedroom. Pray make yourselves quite at home in my absence. You can explain to your friend how the matter lies without the restraint of my presence. I shall try over the Hoffman, Barcarolle, upon my violin. In five minutes I shall return for your final answer. You quite grasp the alternative, do you not? Shall we take you, or shall we have the stone? Holmes withdrew, picking up his violin from the corner as he passed. Does he know about the stone? He knows a damned sight too much about it. I'm not sure that he doesn't know all about it. Good Lord! The boxer's sallow face turned a shade whiter. Ike Sanders has split on us. He has, has he? I'll do him down a thick, un for that if I swing for it. That won't help us much. We've got to make up our minds what to do. Half a mo, said the boxer, looking suspiciously at the bedroom door. He's a leery cove that wants watching. 
I suppose he's not listening. How can he be listening with that music going? That's right. Maybe somebody's behind a curtain. Too many curtains in this room. As he looked round he suddenly saw for the first time the effigy in the window, and stood staring and pointing, too amazed for words. A fake, is it? Well, strike me. Madame Tassad ain't in it. It's the living spit of him, gown and all. But them curtains, count. Oh, confound the curtains. We are wasting our time, and there is none too much. He can lag us over this stone. The deuce he can. But he'll let us slip if we only tell him where the swag is. What? Give it up. Give up a hundred thousand quid. It's one or the other. Merton scratched his short cropped pate. The stone is here in my secret pocket. I take no chances leaving it about. It can be out of England tonight and cut into four pieces in Amsterdam before Sunday. He knows nothing of Van Sedar. I thought Van Sedar was going next week. He was. But now he must get off by the next boat. One or other of us must slip round with the stone to Lime Street and tell him. But the false bottom ain't ready. Well, he must take it as it is and chance it. There's not a moment to lose. Again, with the sense of danger which becomes an instinct with the sportsman, he paused and looked hard at the window. As to Holmes, he continued, we can fool him easily enough. You see, the damned fool won't arrest us if he can get the stone. Well, we'll promise him the stone. We'll put him on the wrong track about it, and before he finds that it is the wrong track it will be in Holland and we out of the country. That sounds good to me. Cried Sam Merton with a grin. What do ye think I'm going to snatch it off you? See here, mister, I'm getting a bit tired of your ways. Well, well, no offense, Sam. We can't afford to quarrel. Come over to the window if you want to see the beauty properly. Now hold it to the light. Here. Thank you. With a single spring Holmes had left from the dummy's chair and had grasped the precious jewel. Before they had recovered Holmes had pressed the electric bell. We give you best, Holmes. I believe you are the devil himself. Not far from him, at any rate, Holmes answered with a polite smile. But, I say, what about that bloomin' fiddle? I hear it yet. Tut, tut, Holmes answered. Watson lingered with Holmes, congratulating him upon this fresh leaf added to his laurels. Lord Cantlemere, sir. Show him up, Billy. This is the eminent peer who represents the very highest interests, said Holmes. Holmes advanced affably, and shook an unresponsive hand. How do you do, Lord Cantlemere? It is chilly for the time of year, but rather warm indoors. May I take your overcoat? No, I thank you, I will not take it off. Holmes laid his hand insistently upon the sleeve. I am quite comfortable, sir. I have no need to stay. I have simply looked in to know how your self-appointed task was progressing. It is difficult, very difficult. I feared that you would find it so. There was a distinct sneer in the old courtier's words and manner. You take a great liberty, Mr. Holmes. 
In 50 years of official life I cannot recall such a case. I am a busy man, sir, engaged upon important affairs, and I have no time or taste for foolish jokes. I may tell you frankly, sir, that I have never been a believer in your powers, and that I have always been of the opinion that the matter was far safer in the hands of the regular police force. Your conduct confirms all my conclusions. I have the honor, sir, to wish you good evening. Holmes had swiftly changed his position and was between the pier and the door. To actually go off with the Mazarin stone would be a more serious offense than to be found in temporary possession of it. Sir, this is intolerable. Let me pass. Put your hand in the right-hand pocket of your overcoat. What do you mean, sir? Come, come, do what I ask. An instant later the amazed peer was standing, blinking and stammering, with the great yellow stone on his shaking palm. What? What? How is this, Mr. Holmes? Too bad. Lord Cantlemere, too bad, cried Holmes. My old friend here will tell you that I have an impish habit of practical joking. Also that I can never resist a dramatic situation. I took the liberty, the very great liberty, I admit of putting the stone into your pocket at the beginning of our interview. The old peer stared from the stone to the smiling face before him. Sir, I am bewildered. But yes it is indeed the Mazarin stone. We are greatly your debtors, Mr. Holmes. Your sense of humor may, as you admit, be somewhat perverted, and its exhibition remarkably untimely but at least I withdraw any reflection I have made upon your amazing professional powers. But how, the case is but half finished, the details can wait. No doubt, Lord Cantlemere, your pleasure in telling of this successful result in the exalted circle to which you return will be some small atonement for my practical joke. Billy, you will show his lordship out, and tell Mrs. Hudson that I should be glad if she would send up dinner for two as soon as possible. 